Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here from Live and Let's Dice, and I have a literal monster of a video for you today, as recently I was lucky enough to sit down with Alex Hall and Jamie Perkins, aka two of the developers of an upcoming title so big that I couldn't wait to share it with you all. That's right, it's Monster Hunter World, the board game. I know, lucky me, right? Especially seeing as I'm a huge fan of the franchise in question, wet stoning my whistle all the way back in the PS2 glory days of the original video game. Therefore, to learn that this was getting the board game treatment and by a team that has already brought the likes of Dark Souls, Devil May Cry and Resident Evil 2 to life on the tabletop filled me with excitement. And maybe a tiny bit of fear as well, because if you've seen the size of the monsters in these games, they could pick their teeth clean with me. So what I'm going to do today is give you my first impressions on this board game based on the play session that I had. And a big shout out to Steamforged Games for setting this up, thank you very much for inviting me along. And by the end of it, I'll give you my opinion as to whether you should be excited about kickstarting this game when it drops on April the 20th. With that in mind, let's get hunting. To begin with, let's talk about what Monster Hunter the board game is. This is a fully co-op experience for up to four players who band together in order to take on monstrous beasts and then harvest their remains for materials in order to build better weapons and armor in order to then take on even more deadly hunts. However, before I even stepped foot in the lair of the beast, I was hit by an interesting design choice. For you see, once we'd selected our hunt, in this case it was a giant Anjanath that had been causing trouble in the local area, Jay Jamie asked me not to plop down my character and begin swinging wildly like a madman that I know I am, but instead pick up a narrative book and begin reading. After the opening paragraph, the group was given a choice, and this choice led to yet more world-building narrative pieces, each with branching decisions, some that rewarded us with precious materials that could be used at the end of the hunt to upgrade our gear, and others which ended up damaging our hunters before we'd even got into the fight. <sighs> yeah, I made a lot of mistakes in this part. <laughs> I have to admit that I absolutely love this choose-your-own-adventure prelude, as it set the mood of the encounter brilliantly, and I could immediately see how much replay value such a mechanic would give to the game. Especially as I was told that you could go through these hunts multiple times, meaning that you could go through the branching narrative paths in different ways, and maybe not make a ton of mistakes that meant that you and your party rocked up to the battle with 2 HP. I should not be put in charge of these things. <laughs> And this lead-in narrative device also allowed for the game to reflect its video game partner really well, because going through the choices again, knowing where some might lead, perfectly mirrors a player learning more about their prey and environment on subsequent runs, which, as we all know, is part and parcel of any Monster Hunter experience. And along the way, we also began to collect tracking tokens, and at first I wasn't entirely sure what these were for, until it was revealed to me that once these tokens were flipped in a later section, their value added up would actually end up shaping the monster's AI deck, which it uses for attacks and movements. And what's really interesting about this is that while it doesn't make the upcoming hunt any easier per se, seeing as a brutal move will always be added into the deck no matter how well you track the beast, what it does allow you to do is tailor the fight just a little bit. For example, you might notice that the upcoming hunt has a fire-breathing attack, and just so happens that you are wearing fire-resistant armor, so of course you're going to want to track just enough to make sure that that is the card that gets added in. It's still going to hurt but it's possibly going to hurt a little bit less. And trust me, when the fight actually started, it was so bloody brilliant. Now, there is a lot going on when it comes to combat in this game, so what I'm going to try and do is pull out the top features of it to really sell it to you. For a start, it's actually the monster that dictates the pace of the battle, because as soon as the fight begins, it activates first. And on its behavior card, you'll see indicators of where it will move, what damage it will do, and in what directions. And if you're a fan of the Dark Souls miniature game, you'll actually recognize the layout of the cards in question. However, if you look to the right of the cards, you'll arguably see something even more important than the hit you're about to take in the face. These being the amount of hunter activations you have until the beast attacks again, and how many cards each hunter is allowed to play in their activation. I cannot express how much I adore this mechanic, because it makes total sense. If a monster is slamming its body into the ground with all of its might, then of course the hunters are going to get a few more activations and attacks on it as it struggles back to its feet. And 
inversely, if it's charging directly at you, you're not going to have as much time to react and therefore have less activations and be able to play less cards in your turn. And speaking of having little time to react, after watching Alex get flung into the nether thanks to my poor choices leaving us all on low health and him tanking the first hit of the battle, we were able to finally enact our revenge. And it was here that I gulped so loudly that I think my neighbours actually heard it, as this monster had a whopping 65 points of health. How the hell were we going to take it down? Well, my friend, with careful planning, teamwork, and a whole host of combo attacks. So each player draws five cards at the beginning of the battle, and each will show how many damage cards they can deal to a beast, how much damage it will block for them if they play it defensively, or how much movement it would offer them should they choose to play the card face down. Now at first, seeing how many different ways each card could be played was a little daunting at first, but once I understood the mechanics which were explained so well and made so much sense, it was maybe only one turn of combat before I was looking at my hand going, oh I can combo this together, I'll use this to move here, and then slam the beast right in its back. Backbone. Now each card that you play, face up or down, is put onto a stamina board, and this represents your hunter getting more and more exhausted the more they try to accomplish in battle. If the gauge becomes full, then they leave themselves open to attack, unable to play cards to defend against the damage, and can even end up fainting which acts kind of as the group's life system, and of course there are only a finite amount of. And this creates a beautiful blend of risk versus reward, meaning that you can look at your hand and go, maybe now isn't the right time to attack, I might be able to do a bit of damage but if I hold off, maybe I can combo more cards together, exhaust myself fully, but possibly finish off the boss in one go. And when you do strike, there's no need to worry about rolling to hit or to wound on dice, as here you instead draw from a special damage deck, which as it depletes represents your weapon growing dull. In order to keep your weapon sharp and shuffle the used damage cards back into your deck, you need to take preparation actions which cost you a turn, and as you can imagine, when you've got a monster the size of a house running rampant towards you, you need to pick the right moment to do so very carefully, because there's nothing worse than being caught with your trousers down and your wet stones out in your hand. Now, these are just the basics of combat because there's so much more going on here. There's like elemental damage, there's the ability to target specific parts of a monster which if you break them will affect how they attack, maybe how they act, and also what items you get at the end of the hunt, and also there's tons of other bits as well like terrain placement, movements, there's a lot going on. All of it though is brilliant, but I want to spend some time focusing on an area that I found very, very interesting, and that is the characters that you can play as. When speaking about designing the player characters, Alex was quick to point out that the way that he approached this Herculean task was to think of them each as weapons and build from there. Noting that while a casual player might look at the roster and see, I don't know, three characters with just an assortment of swords, the actual difference between a greatsword and a dual blade wielder, as in the video game, makes for a huge difference in how they play. For example, I selected the greatsword wielding hunter because I like playing like that, tank a few hits as long as I can deal out huge amounts of damage with a charge attack later on, and I found that my deck was basically filled with things that allowed me to do that, but also to deflect damage and I could stay in the fight up close and personal with the beast as long as possible, but Charlotte, who was also playing with us, went for the dual blade wielder, and that meant that her deck instead was filled with tons of quick damage dealing combos that allowed her to roll through all of her damage deck really quickly, but as a result of her chewing through that damage deck meant that she had to take more turns to sharpen her blades more often, leaving her more vulnerable and exposed. Seeing these differences in action truly forces you to work together as a team, and soon enough you're choosing which hunter should activate first, how to provoke and manipulate the very wild game in front of you, and when to retreat in order to heal, sharpen, or simply set up your big next swing. Everything about this battle system feels tense, and not in a draining way, but in a sense that you're constantly rushing full of adrenaline, and it means that there's no downtime whatsoever, because every player is doing something at different points you're constantly discussing what is the best move going forward, and I love that camaraderie that builds as a result. And at long last, after a brutal flurry of blows, the beast was dead, and we were able to harvest items from the monster by rolling dice which actually allow you to take rewards based on their value. And it was here that Jamie pointed out that you could actually combine the face value of your dice together to go for a rarer component instead of a few more common ones. And then Alex chimed in as well, saying that what you could do is because there was free trade between the players, it meant that if I rolled something that he wanted from the table, he could swap with me at any given point, and I love that, because at the end of the day, we're all fighting together to bring down the big bad, it shouldn't be about hoarding items yourself or keeping stuff that you personally don't need. 
Again, it's a simple yet brilliant way to forge that co-op mentality that is so thoroughly embedded in the video game counterpart, so it was great to see it realised here. And speaking of counterpart, Palicos are indeed here. If you fancy a little extra edge against your opponent, your team can draw one of these cute little critters at the start of the hunt to help you out in a pinch. Each of them provides amazing but one-time buffs designed to help you out when you truly need it, and I can see people backing this on Kickstarter just for the adorable artwork on these alone. All in all, I had an absolute blast with this game, and even though that some of the mechanics at first seemed a little bit daunting, within maybe one round of combat we were all running rampant, destroying monsters with ease because they're so perfectly well realised and really simply explained. There's a lot to remember, but it's not difficult stuff to remember. And the use of the stamina gauge as well has to be applauded, as it's a really effective method of both empowering the player to unleash incredible combos, but also leaves them in a vulnerable state should they expend too much energy. It's incredible to see so many elements running together so seamlessly, and features like the choose your own adventure opening, the evolving enemy deck AI, and brilliantly realised character progression means that the replay value of even the core set alone is going to be through the bloody roof. So, monster sized question, do I rate this game? Yes. Am I very excited about this coming to Kickstarter and seeing what other goodies are going to be dropped alongside of it? Yes. Am I going to be playing through this with Mikey and Lawson as soon as we get a physical copy of this game? Well, of course, mate. I mean, no questions needed there. And there we have it. Those are my thoughts on Monster Hunter World, the board game. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. Are you thinking about picking this up? Are you excited about the different options that might be coming our way when this drops on Kickstarter on April the 20th? And are you a big fan of Monster Hunter? If so, what character are you looking forward the most to playing. As always, I've been Jules. I want to give a massive shout out to Steamforged Games. Thank you so much for inviting me along to play this, and I hope that you, yes, you watching this video out there, have a big bad beast. Have a good day. Until then, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. I'll speak to you soon. Peace.